think we lost. Okay, hold on one second. Lost current. There he is. Okay. Great. And if the speech for steering committee could keep admitting people, that would be great. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you all for being here. We're very excited to have Dulce Vasquez and Councilmember Curran Price on for a mobility debate for Council District 9. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and we can kick things off. Okay, so um, I'm Michael Schneider. I'm on the Streets for All uh, Steering Committee. Thank you for being here tonight. And um, before we get started with the debate, um, five, five minutes of uh, context and history about mobility in Los Angeles. We'll go into opening statements from the candidates. Each will have two minutes. We'll go through a series of curated questions. Uh, we'll get to audience Q&A and then two minutes for closing statements. So just a little bit of context and history about um, mobility in our city, starting with plans. Um, in 1977, Los Angeles released a bike master plan. It had 673 miles of bike plans and they installed five. In 1996, uh, we had a 96, uh, 1996, we released another plan. It was 1,680 miles and 104 miles were installed. In 2010, 1,684 miles, 100 miles were installed. And in 2015, the Mobility Plan 2035, 500 miles and 37 miles have been installed to date. So our city is really, really good at plans and we're really not good at the implementation part of plans. So um, going along that vein of, of bike lanes, how do we implement uh, bike plans? Well, first of all, excuse me, one second. Um, so the pavement has to be perfect. Um, the city has been sued a number of times by people biking and their tire gets in a crack and they've fallen. And so the city no longer stripes in bike lanes unless the pavement is perfect. So uh, bike lanes are only painted uh, down really when you have perfect pavement, which is during the repaving process. The council office has to be interested. So it doesn't really matter if it's on the mobility plan, there needs to be an interest. Um, the council office sets the bar on outreach a uh, little bit of little uh, nebulous. And then LADOT can spend months or years making the council office happy. And if and when the council office signs off, the project is then implemented. Um, it's a block by block, mile by mile process that is just very, very broken and how we have 37 miles um, out of mobility plan seven years. So um, in the context of the whole city, there's 500 miles of bike lanes planned and 208 miles of bus lanes planned under the mobility plan 2035 of which 37 miles of bike lanes have been implemented and 30 miles of bus lanes. Again, this is a 20 year plan and we're getting close to the halfway point. Within CD9 specifically, 18 miles of protected bike lanes have been planned, 2.7 miles have been implemented. Um, the plan includes protected bike lanes on Jefferson, MLK, Maine, Central Avalon and Figueroa. Uh, for bus lanes, there's 12 miles of bus lanes planned, 1.5 miles have been implemented. And uh, the plan calls for bus lanes on Figueroa, Broadway, Vermont, and Slauson. And uh, specifically uh, in CD9, it's, it's quite dangerous. So our city has mapped what they call a high injury network. These are 6% of streets in the city of Los Angeles that account for 70% of injuries and deaths. And so these are especially dangerous streets. And unfortunately, a lot of them are in CD9. And you can see this on the map here um, that the, it's, it's more common than it should be. So, um, you know, we have an audience here that uh, may be in charge of implementation of the mobility plan, and we have a ballot measure called Healthy Streets LA, and we have a brand new video we want to share with everybody. It's just 90 seconds. I'm going to go ahead and hit play. LA has the worst traffic in the country, and we lose $19 billion a year in lost productivity because of it. Our air is so dirty that breathing it is the equivalent of smoking up to four cigarettes per day. Our streets are also dangerous. 
A majority of Angelinos feel unsafe crossing the street, and a pedestrian is killed every three days. But the average trip in the city of Los Angeles is only three miles. There's a huge opportunity to get people out of their cars if we just gave them the infrastructure to do so. In 2015, LA City Council passed a mobility plan that's full of over 1,500 miles of improvements for pedestrians, cyclists, transit riders, and drivers. But seven years in, we've implemented only 3% of the improvements. At that rate, it will take over 200 years to fully implement. Healthy Streets LA is a ballot measure that would mandate that the city implement its own mobility plan any time it repaves the streets. It would both save money and dramatically speed up the implementation of safer, more multimodal streets. You deserve a city where it's safe to cross the street, or use a bike, where it's efficient to take the bus, and where roads are reserved for those that need to drive the most. Learn more at HealthyStreetsLA.com. And let's change the city together. So we're well underway in signature gathering. Uh, we have a end of May deadline, and uh, we're very excited about this, and it would mandate the city implement its own mobility plan during the repaving process. Okay, we're now going to go into candid opening statements. Um, the way we're gonna do this is the order is gonna go back and forth. So Kern, you can start on opening, and then um, then Dulce, and then the next question will be Dulce first, and then Kern, and so on and so forth. So with that, I am, um, one second here. All right, um, Curran, whenever you're ready. Okay, thank you, Michael, and thank you to Streets for All for having me here today. How timely is this debate on the eve before South LA kicks off its universal basic mobility pilot? For residents of CD9, mobility provides access to education, employment, housing, healthcare, and other basic necessities. We oftentimes talk about emerging modes of transportation. Well, the future is here and now and it starts in District 9. So what is universal basic mobility? Well, think of UBM as the mobility version of guaranteed basic income, which I first proposed in 2021 and is now the largest program of its kind in the country. UBM is nearly an $18 million pilot that will benefit neighbors in my district, offering 2,000 low-income participants $150 a month for 12 months uh, to use for public transportation and shared mobility expenses. That's huge. And in my community, where we have amongst the highest ridership and the lowest medium income in the city. But it goes further than that. Within the next two years, this UBM pilot will make it possible for expanded services that include the installation of 250 e-bikes, 100 new shared EV cars, free on-demand EV shuttle services, and electric vehicle charging facilities. Uh, you know, all concepts that were once uh, uh, isolated uh, to the west side of our city. Besides increasing access to transportation options, UBM will serve as a vehicle to ensure that no one is left behind while addressing climate change simultaneously. Uh, as chair of the Economic Development and Jobs Committee on the Council, I'm proud to say that there is also a workforce component in UBM. Over 200 participants are gonna have the opportunity to take part in job training programs in EV and e-bike maintenance at LA Trade Tech. Accessible, affordable, and safe, sustainable transportation should never be considered a privilege for a few. I'm delighted that it's happening under my leadership in CD9. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Dulce. Hi, everyone. Thank you. Um, I'm seeing some fodder in the chat, so um, bear with me. I'm Dulce Vasquez. I'm running for Los Angeles City Council in District 9. I was born in Tampico, Mexico. My parents brought me here when I was seven years old. I spent the next seven undocumented cleaning houses with my mom. My mom still cleans houses to this day. My dad works in construction. I'm a working class, first generation college graduate, and I earned my master's in public policy from UCLA's Luskin School. Yo soy Dulce Vázquez, me estoy postulando para el Consejo Municipal de Los Ángeles en el Distrito 9. Nací en Tampico, Tamaulipas. Mis padres me trajeron aquí cuando tenía siete años. Pasé otros siete indocumentada. Mi mamá limpia casas todavía. Mi papá trabaja en la construcción. Es chirroquero. Um, la primera en mi soy la primera en mi familia de ir a la universidad y recibí mi maestría en Derechos Públicos en la escuela de UCLA. 
The pandemic is why I'm running for city council. We watched as cracks in our foundation became full on canyons in the most affected district nine where we rank the bottom of every metric lowest household income, lowest home ownership rate, second highest homelessness rate, lowest educational attainment, highest rate of pollution, lowest voter engagement, lowest green space per capita, the list goes on. La pandemia es la razón por que me estoy postulando para el Consejo Municipal. Vimos como todo lo que pasó dañó a esta comunidad en el Distrito 9, donde ocupamos el último lugar de muchas cosas, de los más, um, uh, uh, los números menos de, de, de ser dueños de nuestras propias casas, uh, la, lo, la, los números más bajos de educación formal, la lista sigue y sigue y sigue. I'm running on three issues, housing, transportation, and small business. Me estoy postulando y las tres cosas que me quiero enfocar es viviendas, más viviendas, transportación y apoyo para las, los negocios pequeños. Aquí estoy para, para enfocarme en transportación porque creo que entre las tres cosas hay mucho de qué, um, de qué pedir. Thank you so much. We're now going to go into our first question and I'm going to turn it over to Katrina. Thanks, Michael. Hi, everyone. My name is Katrina Kaiser, and I'm a member of the Streets for All Steering Committee. Our first question is about how we think about transportation. So for the candidates, as you think about transportation in Los Angeles, it's obvious that prioritizing cars has been the city's mode of operation for the past 80 years. This is evident in everything from parking minimums to street design. While some say, of course we prioritize cars, there's no other way to get around. Others say that more people don't use the bus because it's slow and convenient. It lacks its own lanes. People might feel unsafe for various reasons. And more people don't bike because they feel like they're going to die with a lack of safe bike infrastructure or have other similar concerns about safety and visibility. Do you believe the time has come for the city to think differently about transportation? And if so, what do you see yourself doing if elected or reelected to change things. For this question, we'll start with Dulce. We absolutely need to reimagine how our city moves. This district has the highest rate of pollution in the entire city. We see a freeway bisecting our district in two different uh, sectors. Um, from everything from parking minimums to bike lanes to bus lanes, we need to move differently. As you see the growth of our city, it's been stagnant over the past probably 10 years in terms of more population growth. So we need to make sure that we can house new people coming in and that we don't in set further incentivize moving in vehicles. We see that happening in, in this district. I am a um, frequent transit user and a frequent frequent bike lane user. And I know how dangerous it is to move about this district. I know how, um, how, how fast cars drive on the street, how we see people behave in their vehicles. And it's time for, for growth in public transportation. It's time to prioritize it by having free fares, by having more frequent buses. We time tax people who depend on public transportation by the fact that our buses move at 10 miles per hour. How would we wanna incentivize anyone to actually get out of their vehicle and into public transit if our buses are moving at 10 miles per hour? I'm fighting for clean, safe, affordable, reliable transit. And it doesn't have to be light rail, but really looking into bus infrastructure in this district. Thank you. And next we'll turn it over to the council member. Thank you. You know, for too long, we've waited for plans that never get completed. I think that was a comment made by Michael earlier. That's why I took matters into my own hands. Over the last couple of years, my office has secured nearly $100 million in pedestrian and cyclist improvements throughout our corridors like Avalon, Broadway, MLK, and Main Street. These street improvements include speed humps, traffic signals, flashing beacons, left turn lanes, protected bike lanes, restriping. And when I'm reelected, I'm gonna to work towards growing these efforts. Now that we have a strong infrastructure bill in place, my team has compiled a list of priority projects that we're prepared to aggressively pursue. An example of this uh, is the Green Alley Network, which my office was first to introduce in the entire city. Green alleys serve as a tool to convert underutilized alleys into community assets and resources for environmental and social benefits. 
That's achieved through light colored paving that reduces urban heat, native and drought tolerant planting to help green and beautify the neighborhood and a host of other innovative uh, techniques. But most importantly, they allow children and families to walk safely or to bike to schools, local businesses and parks. By the end of this year, 10 new sites along Central Avenue and Jefferson are gonna be completed. And it's time to take a more holistic approach to transit in the city of LA. And I'm the candidate that's proven the ability to get the job done. Thank you, council member. Now I'll turn it over to Taranik. Hey everyone. Um, earlier this summer, we did some political polling and we asked likely voters in the city of Los Angeles the following question. Do you feel it is res the responsibility of the mayor and the city council to help reduce car traffic, clean our air, and make our streets and sidewalks safer and more livable, delivering visible, measurable changes that we as residents can see on our streets every day? 84% said yes, they hold the mayor and city council responsible. As a council member, you would be the face of these changes in your district. What transportation and street space ideas or changes would you promote in CD9? Please list specific streets or projects that you have in mind. Well, uh, and we'll go with the, uh, uh, oh, I'm sorry. We'll go with the uh, Dulce. Um, absolutely. It, it is our responsibility to create safe streets, but safe streets aren't just painting a bike lane and expecting people to move out of their way. We have to create protected bike lanes. We have to decide if we're taking away a traffic lane or a parking lane in order to create that level of safety. It takes more than saying, you know, have uh, wider streets. It takes actually painting dedicated bus lane. And it also takes how you enforce those bus lanes so that you actually get traffic moving faster. There are certain areas that we have, um, that we have spotlighted as potential um, complete streets, closing down streets for, for pedestrians, um, both along Vernon and San Pedro and Broadway and, um, and uh, no, that was, Vernon and Broadway and, um, MLK and San Pedro. And um, we also wanna talk to business owners. I've talked to many of business owners who want um, more pedestrian traffic. So how do we widen our streets, create safer streets, um, create our 15 minute city within council district nine, where you have everything that you need um, within a 15 minute commute. So for us, those are priorities in getting the community involved for some of these projects. Thank you so much. Uh, Kren. Thank you. You know, my office has tons of ideas, some of which we're already implementing, like the Slauson Avenue's rail to river project. After securing $30 million in city funding for our partnership with Metro, Slauson is gonna be a beautifully landscaped six mile green belt with pedestrian and cycling amenities. You know, I, I wanna continue our work bringing the first and last mile connections from our major nodes like employment centers, housing developments, entertainment centers, daily activities. My plan is to create livable communities and I'm not waiting for DOT to implement these plans for us. Uh, another initiative that I'm spearheading is our own CD9 bicycle network. This project has been in the works for three years and it will create a complete bicycle network that connects to key community destinations. Uh, major corridors, King Boulevard between Central Avenue and Bank of California Stadium. District will soon see a major facelift with several safety upgrades, including protected bike lanes that range from uh, pedestrian lighting, street planning, uh, and community building amenities. You know, constituents around the area are going to be able to walk or bike throughout this corridor safely. But we're looking at streets like San Pedro, Manchester, Broadway, and Figueroa, and many other corridors throughout the district to bring about the necessary transit improvements for funding. Thank you so much. And now I'll turn it over to Adrian. Thank you, Taranik. It's tough to be a bus rider in CD9. Buses don't have their own lane and get stuck in car traffic at rush hour. City Council unanimously passed a mobility plan 2035 in 2015, which includes 208 miles of bus lanes. However, only 30 miles or 14% have been implemented. In CD9, this includes dedicated bus lanes on Figueroa, 
Broadway, Vermont, and Slauson. As council member, will you let LADOT and Metro implement the mobility plan's bus lanes in CD9, even if it comes at the expense of car space? Also, what is your response to critics who point to declining bus ridership as a reason to ignore these projects? And we will start with council member Kerr and Price. Well, we're currently working on a plan to add bus priority lanes along Florence Avenue during a weekday and peak hours. And let me just say, I, I, I ride the bus. As a matter of fact, I rode the bus last week uh, back to City Hall, and then I do it frequently. Uh, but more importantly, we're talking about converting parking lanes into bus only lanes along, along that Florence corridor. The proposed initiative, I think, provides faster travel times, more reliable service, and will shorten wait time from 13 minutes to seven minutes. And we fully support this. Uh, I know how important it is for working class families like those I represent to have access to safe and reliable public transportation systems. So we're exploring other corridors like Vermont for the possibility of future expansion of these projects. Now, initially, Metro was only exploring the option of converting Vermont into a bus rapid transit corridor. Upon my insistence, I thought to have Metro conduct an EIR that will not only explore rapid transit as an option, but also include light rail as well. I think Vermont is the second highest bus ridership in the entire county. And with these numbers, considering light rail as a solution uh, is only illogical and makes sense. My community deserves clean, high quality transit and Vermont is a perfect corridor to make that happen. Lastly, let me just mention again, as a part of our universal basic mobility project, we're gonna be expanding the LA Now into South LA. LA Now, as some of you know, is an on-demand shared ride shuttle with pre-selected pickup and drop-off locations. Currently, it's only available in the west side. Soon, however, my constituents are going to be, have the option of calling the shuttle to take them to locations across this district. Thank you. Thank you. And then uh, we'll toss it over to Dulce Vasquez. Adrian, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned the mobility plan because from what I remember, uh, the council member was absent from that vote. Um, I would have absolutely been there with Belson to implement the mobility plan and to establish dedicated bus lanes in this district in high transit corridors like Vermont, where they're currently um, researching how either we implement BRT or even light rail. So I want to fast track that project. Uh, the same thing with the river to rail project where it's been sitting as a research project for 10 years, but all of a sudden during election season, we found money for it. Uh, so I think that's very curious, but um, I absolutely, uh, you know, I was, I, I rode transit to work this morning. So I, I see those issues and I do think that we need to prioritize uh, high frequency we need to um, prioritize painted, striped, uh, and protected uh, bus lanes um, and, and bike lanes as well. So um, implementing that and being able to um, provide better service for our constituents where we do have some of the highest bus ridership and, and the critics, you know, the critics don't see it because they don't experience it. They don't live in a district like this where we have many people walking in this um, this uh, high injury network, and we have many people that that benefit from this. Thank you. I think I get the next question. So riding a bike or scooter uh, can be really dangerous in CD9 around South LA, particularly around USC, thousands of people who pretend on bikes or scooters to get around navigate a patchwork of unprotected bike lanes that are in the door zone of parked cars or around delivery drivers idling at curbs. The mobility plan includes 500 miles of bike lanes, but we've only built 37, which is 7%. The plan includes protected bike lanes on Jefferson, MLK, Maine, and Central, as well as closing the gaps that exist along my, the MyFig project and the recent protected bike lanes on Avalon. So the question is, would you commit as council member to implementing a network of safe, physically protected bike lanes in CD9, including letting LADOT implement the mobility plan when opportunities arise during repaving. How will you deal with pushback from Angelinos that don't want to give up car space and can never see themselves on a bike and therefore feel like it's a waste? And for this one, we're gonna start with Dulce. I'm glad you mentioned uh, the bike lanes on Central because again, the council member rejected that proposal uh, 
five years ago when it was brought up against the wishes of community members who did want to see this implemented. So I would absolutely commit to implementing a network of uh, protected bike lanes as a bike lane user, I would greatly benefit from this along with many people who I see when I'm out all the time trying to navigate these systems and for the you know detractors when they don't see it it's not happening just because someone's not using it all the time doesn't mean it's not happening we think about when we're on the freeway and you have six lanes of traffic and there's and there's no one on the road you think oh my god this is great there's no one on the road well like why don't we think about that with bike lanes we think that just because like it's it's open it shouldn't be there um, we need to rethink how we're using our public space and being able to take away parking lanes is going to have to be what we do. We already subsidize parking greatly, even more so than we do public transit. We have come to be a society that expects free parking everywhere when it charge in 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 um, in truth, we should be charging for parking everywhere. Well, you know, my answer is yes. As I mentioned before, I've been working on our CD9 bike network for the past uh, three years. Uh, but my opponent seems to throw some shade, suggesting that it's supposed to happen overnight. It takes some planning and it takes some effort. And I certainly supported uh, a review of bike lanes on Central Avenue, but it was not the best option. You know, we talk about a network of bike lanes, uh, the completion of the My Fig bike lanes along Figueroa uh, were a real landmark. Uh, it connects uh, riders to Expo Park and downtown. And these are protected bike lanes. The City 9 network continues along FIG. It's going to connect our rail to river project, again, which my opponent suggested was only recently created. Uh, but it's going to collect, uh, connect our uh, Avalon's complete street project. My network uh, aligns with DOP's mobility plan. But the main difference is it prioritizes key community nodes like schools and housing and employment centers. Another important difference between my plan and DOT's is that my office is actually seeking funding to get these plans implemented. Uh, just last year, we were awarded $6 million from Metro's active transportation project, which will add protected bike lanes along King, Avalon, and Gage. These connections are just a piece of the larger puzzle we've mapped out that will eventually complete our CD9 bike network of protected bike lanes. I've also directed funding towards implementing our newest bike project called Reimagining Rand Avenue. This project is going to provide protected bike lanes and 88 improvements. Uh, it will be completed in just a couple of weeks uh, along uh, Grand Avenue between Manchester and Slaughter. Thank you. Over to Adrian. Thanks, Michael. South LA has consistently had a disproportionate share of pedestrian and cyclist traffic deaths. It's crisscrossed by arterial streets and freeway ramps where cars speed and there are few marked crosswalks. Campaigns often focus on driver and pedestrian education, while street design that encourages speeding remains in place. How will you work with LADOT to accelerate Vision Zero infrastructure implementation? Mayor Garcetti recently released a budget that proposes a decrease in Vision Zero funding. Do you agree with his funding priorities? And how will you ensure LADOT has the funding needed to address the high injury network in CD9? And we will start with Councilmember Curran Price. Safety is always uh, at the forefront and it takes pre precedence in any project uh, that we do. And so I'm a strong proponent of creating a strong and comprehensive bike network or, or people's streets. Uh, and I'm, but I'm aware that not every street is gonna work for those amenities. Uh, for that reason, my bike network proposes protected bike lanes throughout the entire project. I'm not just picking and choosing. I, I want the entire network in CD9 to have protected bike lanes. Uh, I'm also an advocate for implementing tools and measures that reduce the speed, increase visibility, and enhance amenities for those who walk, who ride, or who roll. Just last month, for example, we, con we constructed five new speed humps throughout the district. That's another example uh, of our efforts to create pedestrian safety. Uh, our safe routes to school uh, is an important element. Since taking office, I secured almost $17 million for safe routes to school at 11 schools in the district, six of which have already been completed. It, it can be enjoyed at Dolores Huerta, uh, West Vernon, uh, Neville, Jose, uh, Jose uh, Quincy Jones, uh, and 28th Street Elementary Schools. 
Some of these improvements, including speed humps, traffic signals, flashing beacons, left turn lanes, protected bike lanes are important. And we will always be an advocate for them with the mayor's office or with DOT. The grant funded initiative creates traffic plans to ensure that students have a safe path to campus. And we wanna make sure that parents, administrators, and community members in training and surveying work together to make these projects successful. Thank you. Uh, Dulce Vasquez, you're next. Thank you. Um, first, I wanna address something from the previous question. Anyone who has actually been on the Figueroa bike lanes would know that those are not protected bike lanes. So I wanted to clarify that. Um, and, and two, I think Vision Zero has been an absolute failure of leadership, both from city council and I'm sorry, from the mayor's office too. Decreasing budgeting for Vision Zero is basically accepting that they couldn't do anything to move the needle on this. And I am someone who is willing to go in there and fight for the reactivation of this project and fully funding this project. But we need to be more creative about what that means. It's not just about speed bumps, it's about actually decreasing speed limits. It's about creating pedestrian islands. It's about adding in roundabouts where the streets are too wide. It's about reducing parking because we have so many incidents, you know, myself, uh, you know, included where people open their, their doors into oncoming um, bicyclists or scooter riders. Um, those are some of the things that help create an infrastructure and really change the culture. We need to stop just saying that Los Angeles is a car city. We need to inherently change how we talk about mobility and say that, no, this is going to be a multimodal city and actually stick to it and prioritize pedestrian safety. Because as we know, this is a high um, incident area. Thanks everyone. The next question is going to be about traffic enforcement. South LA has one of the largest concentrations of traffic violence in the city, where in 2020, CD9 alone saw over 3,000 people injured and 27 killed. The city is currently studying moving traffic enforcement away from the LAPD to LADOT in order to reduce pretextual stops and potential escalation by armed officers. There are also two bills in Sacramento legalizing speed cameras and noise cameras up this legislative session. What is your vision for the balance of personnel and technology and traffic enforcement? What do you see as the best model for safe and equitable enforcement in the future? And with that, we'll start with um, Dulce Vasquez. I'm absolutely in support of both of those. You know, we're a campaign that is um, that is promoting free fares to take away fair enforcement and fair policing from our public transit system. But that goes towards LAPD as well. If you take away um, traffic citations from our police, we know that our Black and brown community members are the ones that are most affected by, um, by, by traffic stops. Um, so taking that away from them and being able to do that in a different, more efficient manner that takes racial profiling away from the scenario, we could save a lot of lives. We have lost so many to um, just traffic stops, um, not just in Los Angeles, but countrywide. And we've seen some cities implement this well, uh, some cities and some states implement, implement both uh, noise cameras and um, speed enforcement and traffic infractions. And we need to look towards other cities like Canada that does this with their buses. When you have bus infractions, we need to be able to learn from different cities and be able to um, be creative about some of this and about how we pay for some of this too in order to keep our communities safer. Um, so. Thank you. Thanks. And next we'll turn it over to the council member. Thank you. Well, I think it's, it's clear that we must support methods that do not rely on armed enforcement uh, to achieve these goals. And again, not just on Metro, uh, but through all forms of mobility. That's why uh, in 2020, I co-authored a motion with 
with a couple of my colleagues that directed the city departments to report back on alternative methods of enforcement. Uh, this included the possibility of transferring enforcement authority from LAPD to LADOT. It certainly came as a direct response to the George Floyd protests and reimagining public safety. Since we introduced that motion, LADOT has created a community advisory task force of diverse individuals who use their lived experiences, their expertise, their community feedback to help develop policy recommendations. Ultimately, I think our goal is to improve our city's transportation experience while advancing racial equity through best practices and data. Uh, we know that this task force has been selected and we should be seeing a report sometime in the coming months. Uh, so I'm looking forward to, to seeing their recommendations and supporting my community with any changes, uh, the necessary changes that we feel are important. Thank you. I think I am the next question. So this is about the Vermont corridor. Uh, Vermont runs inside CD9 for three miles. It's currently the second busiest bus corridor in the city of Los Angeles. And Metro is studying the street for future transit improvements funded under Measure M, looking at BRT, light rail, heavy rail, or just bus lanes. Each treatment comes with trade-offs. BRT can be built very quickly and cheaply, comparatively, while rail can move more people more quickly, but can take, may take a decade before it's completed. What is your vision for transit users along Vermont? Do you prefer light rail, heavy rail, BRT, or bus lanes? And how should Metro balance the needs of current users with potential long-term improvements? And for this, we'll go, we'll start with Kern. Well, I certainly am gonna support uh, those alternatives that my community wants and, and, and supports. But I, I thought to have Metro, as I said earlier, thought to have Metro include a rail line option on Vermont Ave as opposed to a bus rapid transit line only. Uh, as, as I mentioned, Vermont has the second highest ridership in the county, uh, and with 4,500 riders boarding during the week, it's estimated that BRT could have as many as 75,000 riders for a weekday uh, if we pursue that option. Anyway, with these, uh, with these estimates uh, considering light rail as a solution uh, is only logical. I think it's something we should consider. You know, when you're sharing the streets with rail lines and cars, it makes sense to prioritize rail because it makes it safer for everyone. Having an elevated rail line would be ideal, but an underground system, uh, I think should also be taken into consideration. Um, we have, uh, we've talked about uh, alternatives. Uh, we wanna make sure that we are consistent with making certain that we are exploring all options possible. Thank you, cool, sir. So they are exploring all options possible and they have come back to the table with those uh, studies. And um, while talking to community members, to my neighbors, because I do live closest to the Vermont corridor and talking to our neighborhood councils, we want all of it. Um, we wanna see bus rapid um, uh, system implemented as soon as we can, while also simultaneously um, be starting to build heavy rail. We can't wait the 10 to 15 years. We need to be able to expedite um, how we serve our, our district and how we serve Vermont. You know, both lanes right now, both sides of the street have parking on both sides, and those could be immediately uh, used as dedicated bus lanes to move more people and to get service that, that we need. So um, from the, the conversations I've had and, and from my own research on those options, I believe that starting BRT while also simultaneously uh, starting for, for heavy underground rail would be the best option. Thank you. Okay, we're going to go to audience questions. I uh, will do one minute for candidates and you'll say you'll start with this one. So the first question, do you believe that council members should be allowed to veto safe street infrastructure? And maybe I'll just add on to that, uh, the mobility plan. Should they, be able, should they have veto power over the mobility plan in the context of a repaving, for example? No. No, I, I don't think they should. These are, these are macro uses and we can't have uh, individual willpower stand in the way of creating safer streets. I mean, it's the same thing for, for building housing. We should be having um, veto power taken away from our council. 
council members because um, particularly for affordable and homeless housing, it's been ridiculous watching as this council office can't even do the bare minimum uh, to, to get housing approved um, in this district. So the same thing with healthy streets and for any sort of infrastructure changes that ultimately create safer streets, safer sidewalks, safer roads, um, they, they should not have veto power over this. Sorry, are you, there? Are you waiting for me? Okay, great. Yeah. Yes, uh, just, for the record, just for the record, we've completed almost 2,000 units of housing, affordable and homeless housing uh, in the district uh, over the past uh, 18 months, and I'm proud that we're on track to do even more. Uh, but let's talk a little bit about uh, council office role in um, uh, in vetoing or green lighting projects. You know, in Central Avenue is a good example. We explored the option of bike lanes on Central, but it, it discovered that it, they had many challenges. The Central Avenue corridor is comprised of small businesses who are concerned about the loss of parking and the impact of their income. They got families too. Not only do they work and own businesses in CD9, but they live there. As a result of working with both sides, a compromise was reached that we could have bike lanes on Avalon, which is a larger street only a block over, and it connects some of our major parks and schools. I think it's vital to our transit network that this compromise is working well. And it happened because I listened to constituents on both sides and brought them to the table. And listen, I'm not in the business, uh, unlike my opponent, of forcing things down uh, the throat of my constituents. I want to work with them. Uh, that's something you have to do when you're elected. Thank you. Next question. Um, and uh, Karen, you'll go first on this one. Do you support universal free transit? No, and it's, uh, uh, it's yeah. oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Go ahead. Uh, yes, I do. Uh, you know, it's, I, I likened it to uh, universal basic income, in fact, but the universal basic mobility uh, is going to be a game changer in South LA. Uh, in a couple of years, it's gonna make it possible, as I said, for hundreds of electric bikes, e-bikes. It's gonna make it possible for uh, additional blue LA cars, uh, free shuttle services, et cetera. Uh, I certainly think that we should be thinking about a, 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 uh, a wallet, a, a transit wallet that provides benefits uh, to our under-resourced constituents. Uh, in the, our program, this universal basic mobility program, 2,000 uh, participants are gonna get $150 a month for 12 months to use for public transportation, shared mobility expenses. It certainly is, is a start. Uh, I certainly agree that we should have uh, free transportation for not only are those in school, uh, as we're doing with uh, our, our high school students, uh, but also for our seniors and for those who cannot afford to pay. Thank you. Go say. We should absolutely have fare free transit. We, for two, almost two years, we ran basically the country's you know, best pilot on universal free fares. And we succeeded. Tran transit ridership was up during those two years, but our, uh, our, our product was not up to par because we cut so much uh, funding from, from Metro and we cut uh, bus drivers, we cut um, the, the product. Um, so we need to be able to invest even more in it. And right now, 33 cents on the dollar goes towards enforcement of fares. And we have so many people already that qualify for free or reduced fare. This is just more paperwork that we tax poor people with in order to get a service from, from, um, from the city, which should be free. So I think it would save a lot of administrative costs and ultimately create uh, more ridership in our transit system. You. Next question. What areas of CD9 do you think could be good car-free zones? And we'll start with Dulce. Um, two, two places, um, San Pedro Place and um, areas of, uh, of Broadway that we've identified could be car-free. Um, but what, I, what aggravates me a lot is that um, we don't have particular 
business districts that could be whole um, walking, biking, or closed down plazas, we need to be able to incentivize um, more, uh, more businesses in the district, be able to provide them support so that we can create some of the some of the districts that we see in other places in the city where you can come, you know, not just for the LA Live because LA Live wasn't built for the residents of CD9, it was built for tourism, where we can have, you know, when they close down Chickhearn Drive, have people be able to walk and, and, and be able to enjoy the district. Well, certainly LA Live is a, is a good example of a car-free zone and it's an area that I, that I support totally. But we're also in the process of transforming our Slauson Corridor. And I believe that once that's done, it too will be a major attraction center in the city of LA. This rail to river project in the city is a partnership with Metro. It's bringing over $140 million in investment to convert an abandoned rail line into a state-of-the-art green belt in South LA. Uh, this active transportation project is gonna be topped off with the development of a brand new 12,000 square foot high-tech youth center called Slauson Connect. Uh, and riders will be able to stop by the extensive green roof, uh, the rest up, uh, one of the hydration stations, tune up their bikes uh, as they move along this six mile corridor, which incidentally has businesses and nonprofit organizations on both sides. But in addition to all of this work, we're finalizing our Slauson Corridor Transit Neighborhood Plan. Back in 2019, my office won a $750,000 planning grant that will help us address land use issues along the corridor, most importantly, uh, supporting job development. Thank you. Next question, and Karen, we'll start with you. How do you see the role of police on Metro? You know, I, I talked about this before. Uh, again, I think that uh, it's important that we that we uh, have alternate methods of, of enforcement. Uh, you know, I certainly think it's important that we work with Metro to promote their zero tolerance for any harassment on the system. Uh, and, and that includes uh, from those who are uh, providing supposed safety. You know, my office was part of a $350 million investment in the A line, only known as the Blue Line, back in 2019. And so we've helped to promote the, the uh, Transit Watch application, which allows users to connect directly with security offices, the phone, or to chat, or, or video for assistance. Uh, they can also call the uh, point solution box and help operators identify a person's locations. You know, there's also a sexual harassment hotline that has live counseling that can provide 24 seven service to victims. I, so again, we have to be doing a variety of things. Uh, I wanna bring up again, this community task force uh, advisory effort, whose goal is to bring back some specific recommendations on better policing and better policy protocols. I wanna see more resources. I wanna see unarmed responses and I wanna see them now. Thank you, Gil, sir. Um, so first, I want to comment on, on Slauson because that wonderful neighborhood uh, building that the council member mentioned, he was also absent for the vote on the lease of that space. Um, but on policing, you, you've heard my stances of policing. The first thing you have to do is eliminate fares uh, so that we ha stop having officers or Metro Police uh, do fare enforcement. We need to up our traffic ambassadors, so unarmed, uh, unarmed um, responses that are just available uh, to people that are in need of help in any of our large transit hubs. We need to be able to, um, to, to work together with community in order to have uh, different methods, but to make people feel safe in the absence of armed officers. So I would work towards that. Thank you. Next question. Um, CD9 is also home to the 90011 zip code, which is the poorest and highest risk in terms of health in the city of Los Angeles. What would you implement to expand the life expectancy of CD9 and reduce noise pollution? And we'll start with Dulce. So um, 
we have, you know, a very large freeway that cuts through um, our district and, and, and part of that zip code. It's not just about noise pollution, there's noise pollution, there's actual pollution. This is one of the um, worst air pollution in the entire city. So part of that um, and things that I've mentioned before is uh, reducing our speed limits. It's increasing um, our, how we use our space, how we diminish idling in our city. I, I think that's a big contributor to a lot of it, obviously through mm -hmm. traffic, but there are other methods too. Right now we have a lot of delivery trucks going out and about the district and out and about the city. So how do we make sure that we have lower uh, emissions in the entire city? So working towards uh, some of those things and how we use our space, how we make them faster are, are some of the ways that we can combat it. Karen? Thank you. Well, you know, over the past uh, several years, we've invested almost $60 million cleaning up all of our parks, uh, new recreational areas, new green space, uh, better lighting, uh, more cameras, more recreational facilities. And we're going to continue doing that because the green space is at a premium in our district. I mentioned before that we were pioneering in converting our alleys into green spaces. Uh, these are remarkable areas providing uh, access uh, to families, to kids uh, in these alleys that were once impassable. Yeah. You know, we planted over a thousand trees <laughs> in the district since I've been in office. And again, uh, these trees are in uh, areas, in residential areas, commercial areas, retail areas, all throughout our district. We've also distributed hundreds of trees <laughs> to friends and neighbors at weekly farmers markets. And we were going to continue doing that, making these resources available. Stephanie, please mute yourself. Thank you. OK, this is going to be our last question. And then we will go to closing statements. Um, what would you do besides bike lanes and increased transit service to encourage CD9 residents to get out of their cars? I will start with Dulce. First is communication. Um, it's communicating how what a benefit this is to our community and I think there are so many things that um, this community lacks in terms of uh, of information we've seen in in this uh, group alone how translation is needed um, it's teaching our community the benefits of biking but creating that infrastructure uh, creating you know how you use helmets uh, providing free helmets it's providing um, resources on on 311 it's how we um, create this community and how we talk about it, but that's part of including the community in some of this and having you know one project along Slauson where you're still going to have cars and you don't have the business infrastructure to contain to contain that pedestrian friendly activity is not it. So really being um, re being responsive to the residents of this district is how you encourage more. Karen? Thank you. And certainly, I think we have to set a, a, an example. So while we are encouraging traffic calming activities uh, with our vehicles, uh, encouraging folks to use public transit, uh, you know, we also got to get them started on in bikes. Uh, you know, I've talked about the extensive bicycle network that we're creating in CD9, unprecedented uh, in an urban area like ours. Uh, and we're moving forward with that. In addition, you know, at uh, community events and programs, we've given away hundreds and hundreds of bicycles to our youth, uh, encouraging them to, 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 to use bikes, encouraging them to have a helmet, encouraging them to use intermodal, other uh, intermodal alternatives. So I've, I've been, uh, been active by, by demonstrating what's possible. And these bikes have made a tremendous difference in the lives of uh, young people who did not have them. But you know, kids know how to use a bike. They know how to go to and from, uh, and I've been hearing great stories about how individuals are appreciative of these, uh, of the bikes and who are using them as well. Thank you. Okay, uh, before we go to closing statements, just wanna plug our next and final City of Los Angeles uh, mobility debate, and it will be for Council District 15, and that will be on May 3rd. So we will go to closing statements now. We will start with Dulce, Dulce, two minutes. 
First, uh, thank you for hosting this. Uh, this is the first time that the council member and I have gotten to do this uh, in front of an audience, and this might be the only time that we get to do it. So I appreciate it, Michael, and the entire um, the entire board for allowing us this space uh, to talk about really, really important issues. Um, I've prioritized three things as part of our campaign. It's housing, transportation, and small business, and they're all interrelated. There's deep intersection with other major social issues, including addressing zoning practices, housing insecurity and affordability, long commute times. We've got 66% of our district that drives uh, over uh, 30 minutes uh, to their workspace or school, um, economic investment and revitalization, and much, much more. And that's why you know, we've, uh, we've been working with small businesses and entrepreneurs. We have to rethink, you know, not just small business, but really investing in, in the next generation um, of people that look like us, that are our age and wanna create roots uh, in this district. In me, you have a candidate that is a transit user and has been, you know, since I was taking the, the bus with my grandmother in Mexico, the bus has given me the freedom in middle school to go out to the mall and hang out with my friends and in, in college and in the places that I've traveled to, no other city that I've traveled to is, is so um, unfriendly. To, traffic, uh, to transit users like Los Angeles is. And why is that? When we think about major global cities of which Los Angeles is one, Tokyo, London, Paris, we need to be competitive with them. We need to encourage transit. And I wanna be that candidate to start at the city council level to implement that world city that we need to be. So I thank you for your time this evening and hope I can earn the vote of, of those that live in this district. Thank you for being here. Kern? Well, you know, riding the bus does not qualify one to be a city council person. You know, I rode the bus in junior high school. I rode the bus in high school. As I said, I rode the bus last week. Uh, and it's important that we have someone who understands the importance of policy and making things happen. You know, I, I, I want to close by saying that together, I think we've been reforming, transforming LA, trans, LA from a car-centric city into a more vibrant and inclusive place. That, it, that it aims to provide accessible public transportation, safety infrastructure, and environmentally conscious development. I'd like to say it can happen overnight, but unfortunately it can't. While we're creating liberal streets that cater to individuals of all walks of life, again, I want the, our kids to be able to bike to and from school using protected lanes. I want the senior to, to go to laundromat uh, under shady trees, and, and I want folks to use public transit to get to work uh, and get to uh, the, the home in a safe and safe manner. As the incumbent and someone who has lived experiences in the ninth district, I intend to build upon the great successes uh, the team Price has achieved in transportation. And while there is so much to celebrate, there's even more, I think, to look forward to. We can't lose any momentum. As we move forward with these plans, my district deserves someone with the experience to get the job done. Uh, I've been serving in public office for 20 years at the, Senate, at the state level and local level, and I got a history of getting things done. I'm proud to say I've demonstrated my effectiveness and achieved many accomplishments during my two terms serving on the council. And I'm most proud of being recognized as a coalition builder, someone who can bring people together, someone can help resolve issues. My platform remains focused on uniting all brothers and sisters in the community, no matter the color of their skin, their gender, sexual orientation, religion, age, or background. The policies and triumphs that I've led from ban the box, legalizing street vending to increasing the minimum wage, have all positively impacted our most vulnerable populations. I'm proud to have support of the Planned Parenthood, Stonewall, LA Democratic Party, Young Dems, uh, you. Alex Padilla, and others, community leaders, and I would honor to have your support as well. Thank you. Well, um, this was a great debate. We covered a lot of different topics. I know it's not easy to uh, go through all these topics on the fly. And also, these topics honestly don't come up that much in elections in Los Angeles. So we're grateful for your time and participation. Um, we encourage everybody to vote. Be sure you're registered to vote and go vote. And uh, thank you for your time. And have a good night, everybody.